Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is science and metaphysics. My guest is Bernardo Castrup, who has often been a guest here on New Thinking Aloud. He is the author of about a dozen books amplifying his theory of analytical idealism. His most recent books include The Idea of the World. Decoding Schopenhauer's Metaphysics, Decoding Jung's Metaphysics, and most recently, Science Ideated. Bernardo is based in the Netherlands, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Bernardo. It's a pleasure once again to be with you. Love to talk to you, so I'll come back as many times as you invite me. <laughs> well, I, because I think what you're doing in philosophy and metaphysics is so important, I would be very happy to uh, continue these conversations for a long time. You seem to be addressing issues that are are so deep, many people just have a hard time grasping them. And, and also, uh, as you point out in your recent book, Science Ideated, even the proponents of the point of view that you typically tend to criticize materialism don't seem to understand what materialism actually is. Especially the, the very vocal ones. Uh, they they haven't got a clue. Um, it, it can be dramatic even. I was having a sort of written debate with Jerry Coyne some time ago. And Jerry Coyne was saying, well, I'm a materialist. I think even single-celled uh, uh, organisms have qualia. Well, then you're not a materialist because under materialism, consciousness is a property of a, a certain level of complexity. Uh, and very simple animals without a nervous system, like uh, uh, um, certain uh, cr small crustaceans that live in, in, in uh, fresh water, they cannot have qualia. So, uh, coin doesn't understand uh, what materialism uh, is. And many casual materialists, uh, that there is this uh, famous argument against the idealism of Bishop Barclay, uh, Samuel Johnson kicked a stone and said, I refute it does. So that's an appeal to the intuition that matter is what it feels like on the screen of perception, that there is that stone you see and that you feel in your foot if you, if you try to kick it. Uh, but that's not the matter of materialism. The matter of materialism is devoid of any intrinsic qualities. It's pure abstraction. And the concreteness and the solidity of the stone under materialism is supposed to be generated by your brain under your skull, and it's not out there. So what materialism ha has going for it is uh, two important things that, uh, that are ironic. One is ignorance. Um, many proponents of materialism do not know what materialism entails or implies, and therefore they think materialism is more plausible than it actually is, because they don't understand it. And two is the vast incompleteness of materialism, because nobody has ever articulated how arrangements of matter can possibly generate experience, then all possibilities are still on the table. Whatever happens or doesn't happen in the brain, well, it doesn't refute materialism. Why? Because nobody specifies what materialism actually is when it comes to the generation of experiences. So it becomes unfalsifiable precisely because it's so incomplete. I recall from our last conversation, you made an interesting point, and I think it may elude some people, uh, the distinction between science and philosophy. You, you claimed last time we spoke that this is now well understood, that science is about how things behave, and philosophy is about uh, the, uh, the, it's hard to articulate, the nature of things, what they actually are intrinsically. Yeah, if you look at the scientific method, it's an experimental method. So we devise certain hypotheses, we derive the implications, and then we test the hypothesis by posing a question to nature. 
through an experiment. We set up some initial conditions, then we let the experiment run, and nature replies the question and tells us if our hypothesis was true or false, uh, or at least if it was false. Whether it was true or not it depends on it. It's a more complicated question. But the reply from nature is a behavior of nature. Nature does something in response to the experimental conditions you've set up. So science is fundamentally about what nature does, how it behaves in response to experimental conditions. Um, but it says nothing about what nature is. What is that thing that behaves? Science cannot say anything about it because there is no experiment that can directly confirm or falsify a, a metaphysical hypothesis, a hypothesis about what nature is as opposed to how it behaves. Uh, and of course, nature's behavior can be inconsistent with certain metaphysical hypotheses. And on those grounds, you can reject the metaphysical hypothesis, a statement about what nature is or isn't. Uh, but there isn't a direct relation uh, as there is with science, because science is the study of how nature behaves, not what f nature is. Science can inform metaphysics but metaphysics is different from science. Well, and you're referring to a particular type of science here, experimental science. I think prior to experimental science, we had what I, were called the natural sciences, which were basically obs based on observation and probably therefore much closer to your point of view of idealism. I think in today's understanding of science in the West, Experimental science is science. Even theoretical science uh, is only uh, of any value in so far as it is ultimately grounded in experimentation. And if you can't do an experiment now because of technological limitations, at least you, you, you make your science uh, based on the presupposition that at some point you will be able to uh, uh, carry out an experiment to, to validate or falsify your hypothesis. So there isn't such a thing in today's understanding, at least in the Western world, as not experimental science. All science is ultimately uh, uh, sort of driven by experimentation. Um, even theoretical science is ultimately grounded in experimentation. Uh, what you were alluding to, uh, a lot of it happened in the Middle Ages. Um, you could think of that as natural philosophy or philosophical speculation, uh, but the scientific method as understood today is, is, um, it is it, it's not divorceable from empirical experimentation. Otherwise, it isn't really science as we understand it now, uh, which doesn't mean that no other avenue to the pursuit of knowledge uh, is valid. Of course, there are other valid avenues. There is first person experience, introspection, meditation, uh, and there is philosophy. Both are valid. It, they are just different from science. And there is a danger that we try to conflate them with science and the other way around. And we end up sort of doing a disfavor to, to all of them. Well, I am under the impression that there are many people, probably thousands of people, who consider themselves scientists in astronomy and geology and zoology, who are sort of out in the field recording their observations, making field notes and, and reporting on what they observe. That's science. That's empirical science. Even if you don't carry out an experiment, uh, you observe an experiment that nature is carrying out on its own, so to say. So, for instance, it's very difficult to carry out a direct experiment for um, evolution by natural selection. There are such experiments, but it's very difficult to carry out one at the scale of the phenomenon that we speculate about. So what we do, we just observe the fossil record. We observe uh, the genomes of organisms that exist today and we try to find uh, similarities and, and, and lines of derivation and evolution. So but I, I would still consider this experimental science, even if it's not an experiment set up under laboratory conditions. It's, uh, it's the experiment of nature, if you, if you know what I mean. 
Well, I'm pretty sure that uh, practically all scientists would think of themselves as materialists or physicalists, but I know in your philosophical work, you are critical of what you call scientific materialism, which is a very specific interpretation of materialism that probably most working scientists aren't even aware of. It's a conflation between science and a particular philosophical view, which for historical and cultural reasons has been uh, associated with science for a long time. Um, uh, this conflation is based on a number of hidden assumptions. Uh, the people who, who just say, well, science proves that materialism is right, uh, they literally don't know what they're talking about. They do not understand the nuances and subtleties. It's not even nuanced and very subtle. They do not understand the issues uh, uh, at stake and the, w what the problem really is that they are providing an answer to. Uh, they are making all kinds of hidden assumptions that they are not aware of themselves. Specifically, though, scientific materialism, the way you define, well, I don't even think you're defining it yourself. You're drawing on a larger philosophical literature about it, suggests that scientific uh, observations have to be quantitative. Well, that's pretty much a, a sort of a canon of science because um, it's a science, science is a, is a, it's an approach to how nature behaves. You can describe behavior through quantities, and you can even describe your experience of that behavior through quantities, um, just like you draw the map of a territory. The problem is that later on, they try to pull the territory out of the map. They try to pull experience from descriptions of experience, which we call matter. What we call matter under strict uh, on the, the strict philosophical definition of matter and materialism is something that can be exhaustively described in terms of a list of quantities. In other words, if you provide a long enough list of numbers, you will have said everything there is to say about matter. But of course, you will have said nothing about the qualities of experience, because those are qualities, not quantities. And materialists conflate the description of the world with the world and then they try to pull experience out of that description, which is like pulling the territory out of the map. And then, of course, that fails. And they call it a problem. They call it the hard problem of consciousness. And they promise to themselves that at some point we will come back with version two, three or four of the map, a better map. And then we'll be able to pull the territory out of the map. Of course, that's ludicrous. For as long as you're talking about a map, you can't pull the territory out of it. The territory is the thing the map describes. It's, it's not a, a result of the existence of the map. There is a discussion in physics, I think attributed, if, if I'm correct, to John Wheeler, asking, uh, is matter derived from information or is it vice versa? It from bit or bit from it? And uh, he seems to suggest that it is it from bit. In other words, information itself is fundamental. And I think when you, you say that all of the universe can be described mathematically, that's, that's similar to what Wheeler himself is saying, that the physical world is really just information. Yeah, more and more scientists, especially physicists working in foundations of physics, are realizing that our concept of matter um, has no future. It is inadequate. It doesn't, for instance, fit with 40 years of experimentation in foundations of physics. It's contradicted by experiment. So they're trying to find a way sort of to circumvent that. They realize that conceptually speaking, matter is a dead end. Um, it, it's contradicted even by, by laboratory experiments. So we have to find a way around that. So what they do is they try to create an extra layer of abstraction, like information, and they call matter then, quote, baggage, useless baggage. That, that's the word used by Max Tegmark in his 2014 book, Our Mathematical Universe. So here is a mainstream physicist who realizes that, okay, matter, as we define it, it brings us nowhere. So I will call it baggage to highlight the fact that it's useless. It, we, we don't need that. That, 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 that's the, the way out of the problem. Uh, uh, matter goes 
nowhere. It's it's a dead end. So we say, well, we don't need that then. <laughs> um, so we, we call it then pure patterns, uh, pure abstraction, pure information. And you see that in many different works in digital physics, in Max Tegmark's uh, own approach, um, in pan computationalism. And uh, you cannot uh, avoid the problem that an abstraction has created by creating another even deeper abstraction. You're just digging a deeper and deeper and deeper hole for yourself. You have to go back to reality, to come back from the starting point. What exists are the qualities of experience. That's all we have before we start theorizing and abstracting. Um, and moreover, conceptually, it makes no sense to say that the fond foundational level of reality is pure information. It's the same mistake as trying to pull the territory from the map, because information has been defined in the late 1940s as a description of the possible states of a system. That's what information is. To, to speak of information, you have to have something that isn't information, which has states, which information then describes. Uh, so it, it, to talk of information without a, a, an ontological substrate that isn't information, informational and which has uh, states is akin to talking of a dance without anyone who dances, uh, of talking of... Uh, movement without anything that moves, of ripples without water to ripple, of spin without the top that spins. Uh, it's as ludicrous as that, but now, because materialism is such a dead end, it has forced people who cannot sort of take a few steps back, it has forced them to indulge in flights of pure abstraction of a, of a level that we have never seen before in human thought. We are achieving liftoff and abandoning reality. And there are some physicists who are concerned about this. There is a German physicist, um, Sabine, um, I forgot her, her surname, but she's always ringing the alarm bell about this. Now let's come back to the concreteness of empirical reality, instead of sort of taking flight in fancies of abstraction and losing contact with reality. I know some of the people I encounter in the area of consciousness research and parapsychology occasionally use the term information as if that means it must be conscious. I think a lot of people, including physicists, uh, do that without being explicitly aware of it. When we say there is no matter, it's all patterns of information, what we are appealing to is to a form of mentation, a form of mind that can conceive of things, in other words, that can create structural patterns of association uh, of states, inner states, that do not have a objective uh, um, counterpart, an objective embodiment. So we say, well, if it doesn't have an objective embodiment, an objective counterpart, then it's pure information. While what would be the accurate thing to say is it's pure mentation. Because you see, mathematics does not have often uh, objective embodiments. They are pure. It, it's a, mathematics can happen fully and purely in the mind. It does not need an, an embodied thing to exist. Um, Plato already said, well, mathematics is objective in a certain way, but it's objective in the mind. Um, that's the platonic metaphysics uh, of, of mathematics. But if we are honest to what is actually going on, where has all mathematics ever devised always existed? In a mind or in many minds. And you can say, well, what's peculiar about mathematics is that although we are separate minds, mathematics is the same across all minds if it's done correctly. Yeah, that's very interesting. That should give you a pause for thinking whether separate minds are really separate or whether they are grounded in a common substrate. But even taking that into consideration, it's still in mind and in mind alone. So when Max Tegmark says that the universe is pure mathematics and matter is just baggage, the, the direct implication, the intuition that is sort of manifesting through his words is it's all in mind, even if it's not my own mind, because all mathematics that we know always 
has happened in mind and nowhere else. Well, I think the the idea that the universe itself rests on a foundation of mathematics can probably be traced back to Pythagoras, who was something of a mystic. True, and uh, and it uh, the most recent sort of um, elucidation of what this may mean, I think, was by Jung, which we talked about uh, last time, and Jung equated the the inherent regularities of behavior of the universe, the behavior that we describe through mathematics. He, he, he equated it to um, archetypal manifestations. Like if there is a universal mind, that mind operates through archetypes like our minds. And mathematics uh, uh, is an expression of those archetypes. Numbers are archetypes. Marie-Louise von Franz tried to elaborate further on this in a couple of books. One was successful. The other one was, oh, no, she could have done a better job there. Uh, hopefully somebody will take up that thread and, uh, and elaborate more on, uh, on it. But what we call mathematics are just the psychological archetypes of nature's mind. And we are part of nature's mind. That's why Wigner's miracle of the, the suitableness of the language of mathematics to describe nature is not a miracle at all. It's a direct implication of what's going on. Nature has a mind, we are part of it, so we think along the same archetypes as the thoughts underlying the world out there. That's why mathematics describe the world so well, because it's, a, it's basically an expression of those inherent archetypes. In the work of the uh, 18th century poet uh, Goethe, uh, who was both a scientist and a poet, he, he suggested that the, the same archetypes that manifested through poetry also manifested in nature itself. Wasn't it in, the, in part two of Faust, which Goethe wrote towards the end of his life, although he began Faust when he was a teenager still, um, that's literally a lifetime's work, uh, Faust, but in part two, he says, uh, I cannot quote exactly anymore, even the translation would go bad, but something like uh, everything in the world, everything that has an end, everything that is transitory, in other words, the whole of nature, because the whole of nature changes and nothing is fixed. Everything that comes to pass is but a symbol. Uh, it's one of the verses in, in part two of uh, Faust, which, of course, immediately raises the question. A symbol of what? What is the behavior of nature a symbol of? And I think it's a symbol of its own inherent patterns of behavior. It's a symbol of its own archetypes, an expression of its own archetypes. Another argument that you raise in, in your recent book, Science Ideated, has to do with time, that our experience of moving through time is, I, I guess you express it as something of uh, an illusion. Surely. Um, <laughs> look, the past exists only insofar as we experience our memories now. The future exists only insofar as we experience our expectations now. So the past and the future exist only insofar as the present. But what is the present? The present it's nothing because however small you make it, you can cut it in three pieces and say there is a past, there is a present, there is a future. So our whole concept of time, although it is such a strong intuition, it cannot be articulated properly. Wasn't it uh, Augustine who said, uh, uh, if I think of time, I know what it is. But if you ask me what it is, I, then I know not. Um, we cannot even define time without using self-reference. Well, time is the interval between two events. Well, interval is just another word for time. Um, if you really think carefully about it, the idea of time is self-contradictory. It makes no sense. It can't even be explicitly defined in any clear, unambiguous way. Uh, it's based fundamentally on self-reference. In other words, on bagging the question, circular reasoning. So, of course, what we call time uh, cannot exist. And even physics has been for a while pointing in that direction, like uh, the block universe of uh, general relativity indicates that time is not something that flows in one direction. It exists all at once as a block. 
in our experience of time is just an illusion as we traverse the structure of the universe in a certain dimension uh, our cognition of what we see as we traverse that block structure is what we call time in other words there is no time there is only the block universe only our cognition is partial we cannot cognize the whole thing at, uh, in, in one go in one cognitive uh, um, um, intuition uh, global intuition so our cognition sort of breaks things up and we call that break up of cognition time. It's not an objective thing going on out there at all. I think the question of time is the deepest question. Even after we settle into a better metaphysics um, like idealism, if I dare say, even after that, many problems will remain. And the key solution to those problems will be a revised understanding of what we call time and maybe loop quantum gravity will take us there maybe the neuroscience of time cognition which is very rich uh, uh, will take us there or maybe pure introspective insight and meditation will take us there i don't know well the block universe has sometimes been described as uh, a god's eye view of things being able to see all time at at once. Uh, are you sub saying that you, as an idealist, subscribe to the black universe? I think it's inevitable. Yeah, I don't think it, it things can be any different. I mean, th th there are some open questions in physics, like how do we reconcile uh, quantum field theory with uh, um, general relativity? How do we bring gravity into the fields of quantum field theory in a way that remains internally consistent. Uh, so that's an open question. A lot of work is being done on that. But one thing we know at the macroscopic level in which we live, general relativity is true. It, it's experimentally confirmed left and right multiple times over. I, I don't think our uh, um, colloquial, ordinary intuition of time, since it contradicts general theory of relativity, can never be saved. It cannot be saved. Uh, that's old news. We fast that mark already. Because if we look at the implications of it, the, the God's eye view would mean potentially something accessible to human consciousness, at least uh, amongst great mystics, would be to, to see the entire universe uh, from beginning to end, if, if there is such a thing as beginning to end. Uh, we, use, we use temporal language to try to describe something that is by definition not in time, and of course it always goes wrong, but there is no other way to talk about it because time is built into language. We have tenses, you know, uh, language is based on verbs and verbs are action and actions unfold in time. So th th there is no way to talk differently about it. We can only talk around it. And my favorite way to talk around it is the following. Look, um, if we eliminate time, we cannot talk about causality anymore because cause and effect are in time. The cause comes before the effect. So if you take time out of the equation, causality is out of the equation, and people throw their arms up and say, well, how can we even start thinking about what's going on without causality? Because everything around us points to causality. There is an alternative on how to think about that, and that's to imagine that there is structure in the universe, but there isn't causality. And these are different things. Causality is a slit, a, a, um, a narrow view of the structure that exists at once in the universe and structure outside time you can think of it as the semantic links in a database records in a database are associated with one another through links of meaning like my mother's record in the government's database has a link to me because i am her son and i was born in a certain place that place links to all the other people in the database who were born in the same place uh, you know, you have these semantic links in a database and they do not necessarily exist in time. They are not causal. It, it's just saying that one element of a structure is associated with other elements through different uh, uh, um, links of meaning. And, and those links of meaning are not spatial-temporal. They are semantic. You can have semantic structure, and that semantic structure may have an embodiment in space-time, but it doesn't need space-time in order to be said to exist, 
because it's semantic structure, not spatial-temporal or geometric structure. So you can think of the universe as one giant database, which has semantic structure. And because we are monkeys evolved on, on a minor planet of a usual solar system of an average galaxy, um, we cannot cognize the structure all at once. So uh, evolution has given us a slit of cognition. So we can traverse that structure by moving this slit. Think of this slit as this slit on a fence. You don't see the world on the other side of the fence. You can only see what appears through this lid. But you move this lid. So you scan the world by moving this lid. And as Alan Watts said in a wonderful metaphor, if a cat passes on the other side of this lid, uh, you always see the head and then afterwards the tail. Every time the cat passes on the other side of this slit, you always see first the head and then the tail. So we would say the head causes the tail. And that's the view, the causal view of this lit. You cannot see the whole structure at once, the whole cat, the whole semantic structure. You can only experience a part of it. And as you traverse the structure, the semantic structure of the universe with your cognitive slit, uh, things happen in a certain order and you start talking about causality. But there is no causality anymore that the head of the cat causes the tail of the cat. There is only one semantic structure out there all at once, which we cannot see because we would undergo cognitive overload and probably explode. So we have time as a fundamental category of perception, a category of cognition, as Kant and Schopenhauer already said. Uh, what you're expressing reminds me of our previous conversation of Jungian synchronicities. We, we tend to think of these synchronicities as being relatively rare events, but I, I gather you're suggesting that the, the synchronistic view of the universe might be far more pervasive than we imagine. Jung himself he speculated about it, about this. Well, it's more than a speculation. He's basically confessing to his actual view in his letters to Pauli when um, after he sort of carves out a space for synchronicity next to causality as an organizing principle orthogonal to causality. So causality here, synchronicity here. Afterwards, he goes ahead and says, well, actually, we can reduce causality to synchronicity. Causality is just a cognitively partial, limited view of synchronicity. Synchronicity is the pattern of meaning that exists out there all at once. It's the cat. It's the overall structure of the database we call the universe with all its semantic associations. Those are the archetypes, the, the, those semantic associations, the associations that mind makes naturally and spontaneously. And causality is this lit view of it. It's the partial understanding of that. So Jung was, was, he was sharp. He, he was alert to the implications of his own ideas. And he realized that once you put synchronicity on the table, if that's true, then you are forced to reduce causality to it, which is entirely coherent. Uh, it's self-consistent. I mean, whether it's true or not, you can have a discussion, but it is a self-consistent idea. It's not internally contradictory. Well, since we are now engaging in a discussion relative to Jung, I'd like to go to the, I believe it's the last chapter of your book, Science Ideated, in which you're reflecting on some of the ideas of Peter Kingsley, who is largely a Jungian. And Kingsley points out, and you seem to agree with him, that if one holds an image in one's mind of, of something, then that image is real. It is ontologically real, as real as this chair or the electronic communication we're having right now. Yeah, Kingsley is referring to the work of Parmenides, the, his one major poem. What was the name of that poem, I forgot, but the surviving poem of Parmenides and Kingsley's the main argument is that um, scholars misinterpret that that poem left and right. And in Kingsley interpretation, um, to be thought is to exist. So it's a Berkeleyan view of things um, to be experienced is to exist. So and he says that Western culture um, has lost itself 
because it keeps on trying to finding some criteria to differentiate things that are mere hypotheses from things that are actually true. Um, I can go along with that metaphorically. I, I myself cannot go all the way along with that because there is clearly a difference between a false conspiracy theory and, and the facts of the world. But the conspiracy theory exists as an, as an experience in the mind in which it was produced. And I think that's the correct way to think about it. Uh, to be hypothesized is to exist as an experience. Even an illusion exists as an experience. Uh, an experience is not nothing. An illusion is not nothing. There is a difference between an illusion that happened and a hypothetical illusion that never happened and nobody ever imagined it. Nobody ever conceived of it. There is a difference there. And um, and you may say, well, but that says nothing, right? It just means that, yeah, fantasies exist as such, as fantasies. But the the extra depth there is to it is when you say, well, but ontologically speaking, the things that actually exist out there belong in the same category as fantasies. In other words, both are experiential and only experiential in nature. The difference being that what we call a fantasy is your own private experience and what we call the world out there is a shared collective experience. That's the difference between fantasy and reality is whether your idiosyncratic individual fantasy fits in the shared experience, the consensus we call reality. But in, uh, in so far as we are talking about ontological categories, both are in the same category. Both are made of the same kind of stuff, mentation. They are not different in, in their substance. They are only different in the breadth of their expression. One is individual, the other one is far wider than individual. Well, when we talk about the, this far wider realm, uh, sometimes you refer to it, I think, as a transpersonal consciousness in which we're all embedded. Sometimes I hear it expressed as the social construction of reality. As When I was a criminology student, we were taught that reality is socially defined. That seems to be something of an intermediate layer between the personal consciousness and, and the consciousness of the universe or the consciousness of nature. Absolutely. I think uh, um, there are many layers in which we can talk uh, of reality. The reality we live is not the reality of pure percepts, pure perception, pure sensory data. Uh, we always um, lay a narrative on top of pure perception. Otherwise, we, we would see only pixels around us. But we don't see only pixels, we see objects, we see, we see actions, we see tables and chairs and people. Um, these are narratives that we apply to the pixels in order to carve out the pixels into uh, individual entities that are undergoing certain stories. So that whole narrative is already an interpretation of percepts. Um, and that's what we actually live. We live the narrative we project onto the world. That's the experience of life we have. And that narrative, I agree, is a social construct. It's largely, if not fully, determined by culture, by your social context. People in the Middle Ages lived in a completely different reality because they had different narratives. And what you fundamentally experience are those narratives. But I don't deny that below that narrative level, there is something that does not depend on your narratives, something that uh, modulates percepts, pure sense perception. But I think that something, too, is mental. It's not socially constructed. It is objective from our, our point of view. It's really out there. But those are mental states out there, transpersonal mental states that we perceive and then weave narratives on top of that in our own minds according to the cues of culture and society. One of the, I think, most important points you raise is that 
this attachment to scientific materialism or materialism and its various other misrepresented forms <laughs> that, that you describe uh, is largely a social construct. And, and that's one of the reasons why the defenders of that materialism seem to over and over again and end up creating uh, postulates that that seem insane, like people who are consciously trying to prove that there is no consciousness, or with great purpose trying to prove that there is no such thing as purpose. Yeah, yeah. The the most dangerous insanity in our society today is that suffixed by the letters PhD, um, because there is now a degree of sophistication in insanity that gives it a sort of a coating of seeming plausibility. Because if you if you articulate your insanity with enough sophistication and obscure terms and conceptual tie ups that sort of get you all stuck in knots, conceptual knots, you may lose sight of reason and clarity and you may think, well, behind this incredibly complex story, there may be something real that I just can't understand. But the guy saying it can. No, the guy saying it cannot. He is insane, literally uh, insane in a way that is not in the DSM-5 yet. Maybe in the DSM-10 <laughs> it will come uh, uh, there. It is a form of very sophisticated insanity when you say, Experience doesn't exist, and that's eliminativism. Or when you say experience is the properties of uh, uh, physics, experience is mass, charge, momentum, spin, geometric relationships, frequency, amplitude. That's um, 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 that's called um, identity theory. Um, and so there is eliminativism, identity theory. There is illusionism, which is the in immediately self-contradictory idea that experience is an illusion. But wait a moment, what is illusion if not, if, if not an experience? And that's, uh, that's uh, illusionism. So, and these things are funded by grants. Your taxes are paying for the elaboration of insanity. And, and I know my, many colleagues of mine uh, in philosophy will go screaming now for my disrespect towards my colleagues. But I don't have a commitment to my colleagues. I have a commitment to truth insofar as I can discern it. And I think it is very self-evident that illusionism, identity theory uh, and, and, uh, and uh, eliminative, elimin eliminativism are forms of insanity and people who do that feel protected in doing it because it's a form of insanity that that defends the mainstream view. So you feel that you are protected by the mainstream, you're protected by reason because materialism is just reason, right? No, no, materialism is insane. But because the social construct of our culture tells us that that's the most plausible alternative, people feel uh, protected or, and justified to elaborate sophisticated insanity to defend that mainstream. I imagine if we had the ability to take a look at another planet where there was some sort of civilized life form that destroyed itself through war, through pollution, we would also find that the mainstream philosophies of, uh, of the intellectual thought leaders on that planet were similarly insane because they led to the uh, self-destruction of that species. Once egos pop in nature, once the default mode network arises in a nervous system, you immediately run the risk of insanity. And it's almost guaranteed that you'll become insane in one way or the other. The question is, will you manage to survive your insanity long enough that you can overcome it? And that question has not been answered for us yet. I think materialism for the casual person who says, well, I'm a materialist, that's not insanity. The person just didn't think these things through. But for people who dedicated their lives to thinking these things through and are still materialists, that's a form of insanity. So I think materialism as, as a form of insanity encourages our other insanities. 
like environmental destruction. And materialism, materialism encourages this for sure. However, I don't think that you need materialism to have the other forms of insanity that can lead to the end of a species. I think there are, you can still kill yourself even if you are an idealist because you may be an idealist who who derives funny and inaccurate implications from their own idealism. Um, and there is a host of ways in, in which that can happen. So I'm, I'm not ready to blame materialism exclusively for everything, uh, but materialism certainly encourages uh, the stuff we are doing that can lead to our end. Yeah. Well, would you say this, that there is a relationship between the, the very specific scientific materialism that you criticize and cultural materialism, the desire to accumulate more and more? Of course. If you think that matter is the only thing that truly exists and endures, then there cannot be any other meaning in life than the accumulation of material goods. And if you think your mind will come to an end completely at the moment of your death, your con death, your consciousness will be gone, then you have absolutely nothing to lose if the world goes to hell in 2100. You're not going to be here to, to experience that. So you're highly motivated to accumulate material goods, plunder the planet, and not think about sustainability because you have no stake in the future. Not even in the long-term future, the short-term future. Future 2100 is, is tomorrow. But uh, we, are not, we are not going to be here in this form. And if you're not here in any form at all, so what incentive do you have to prevent the Netherlands from sinking? Because the Netherlands will sink in 2100. And the Dutch people know that. We will defend Amsterdam and then we will float half of the country. That's the plan we have right now. Uh, because... You know, our grandchildren have a stake on this. Um, but if we were not materialists and if we understood that the mind in us is the mind in nature, it's the same subject, then things would change. And you understand that collecting insights is a lot more vivid, concrete and real than collecting material goods because your insights will never disappear. They will be seeded into the rest of nature at the moment of your death. So the whole narrative about what's meaningful and what's good would change uh, for the better, for sure. I do think that there are people who would think of themselves as idealists who, who would argue differently. And you did talk about some of the potential errors that idealism can uh, lead to. For example, one might say, well, as in the Bhagavad Gita, you didn't create a life, you can't destroy a life, so why not go to war? It's your duty. I am not a sentimentalist. I don't think that we should all be saints. I don't think nature indicates that that's the way to go. Animals are not saints. But I, I do agree with you that it would be a tragic uh, uh, misunderstanding of idealism to think that uh, if your subjectivity is not going to die, then you can kill people because nothing is lost. I think it's precisely the contrary. I think our state of mind, the state of our consciousness that we call life, is something the whole of nature is pushing to. So there is a value in remaining in this state of consciousness as much as possible because that probably will favor the gathering of insights that cannot be had in any other state of consciousness. So eliminating a life is eliminating something fruitful in nature, not your subjectivity, but the state of consciousness in which you can gather insights for the benefit of the whole of nature. And it is under materialism that you could say, well, you know, your subjectivity doesn't quite exist, really. It's an illusion. So nothing is lost if I kill you. Moreover, even if it does exist, it's going to come to a complete end anyway. So sooner or later it's going to end. So I might just as well kill you. So, you know, you could make the argument the other way around and it would be a lot more defendable. Very interesting. Well, Bernardo... There's so many directions we could take this discussion because there are so many different sciences to talk about and the ways in which consciousness and metaphysics impacts each individual science. I think we've come to a good conclusion for today, but I'm really looking forward to future discussions with you. I think 
you're pushing the idealist perspective harder than anybody else of whom I'm aware. And, and uh, as a parapsychologist, I can't help think, but this is, this is really central to what people need to understand. So once again, thank you so much for being with me. Great pleasure, Jeff. Looking forward to the next round. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.